Hi everyone, Lewis here. Welcome to the next episode of the Cathode Ray Podcast. Number 49, we're almost at the big five zero, doing a little bit of an outside introduction for you. This week on the show, we've got Robert Dale Smith from controlleradapter.com, and he's a full-on controller hacker. So you may have seen him recently in his social media. He took the Fisher Price, looks like a toy controller, and added uh, uh, an embedded chip inside. So now all of a sudden, your toy Fisher Price has one millisecond of lag over USB 3. So anything to do with controllers, he loves hacking. And one of the recent projects he's got out right now is the USB to PCE. So you can use any USB controller on a PC engine, on a real PC engine. Uh, the pre-orders for the next batch are open on controlleradapter.com right now. Me and Steve have a great time talking all about controllers, his projects, the hacking that he does. Let's get right into it. This is the Cathode Ray Podcast. 3DO from a pawn shop when nobody wanted it. And it was like 90 bucks for the console. And I opened it up and it had all these wacky accessories in it. And um, one of them was the original like Super Nintendo two, two inputs to one um, connection into the 3DO. And nice. I had that original adapter and I would just laugh about it because it came in this packaging that was super like we, we will do anything but try to get sued they didn't want to get sued by nintendo even then because it was so like off they weren't even really saying super nintendo it was really cheesy but anyway i saw that i posted that and people had you know linked you on that and then i um so ever since then i had found out about you working on that and um so anyway you know we could start kind of that progress if you'd like to or whatever you know how that kind of led you to whatever you're doing or have done since then and then now what you're doing because um i'll be honest that's really the most compelling thing i saw is what you've been messing <laughs> with the last couple days so yeah <laughs> however you want to get started but that's kind of uh what i was my my first impressions of uh your work yeah, surprisingly, the the stuff I've been posting the last few days is, I think, the most liked post I've ever posted. So <laughs> maybe my next product. I, don't know. <laughs> I joked that there was enough surprising. demand that maybe I'd make some more or, or make a kit. But yeah, the 3DO adapter. Um, I at work, I'd worked on it several Shopify um, applications, and um, so I kind of had my idea and wanted to create something or create a store. Um, and I like you, I'd got a, I got an old 3DO, and but mine didn't come with a controller. Uh, so that's kind of how I, I really got started in realizing that just the controllers were overpriced. And um, I noticed that adapter that that you said you got, and um, it was just like a, over a hundred dollars on eBay. And I was just like, there's, that's even more expensive than, than a regular OEM controller. So I just kind of started digging around the internet, trying to find something. Um, I wanted to like kind of contribute back to the retro gaming space. Like I've seen a lot of these other people who are coming out with all this awesome stuff and also kind of tap that, that urge to, to create an actual Shopify store. So the applications that we were building for the plugins, I could actually be a real shop and test them out. Um, which is funny because now I don't work on the applications anymore for Shopify. I'm just running a Shopify store it kind of flipped over, um, in the process of doing all these adapters, but the 3DO adapter was kind of cool because I had actually found some code, um, on a forum. I think it was on Atari age. Um, or was this actually some screenshots of a project to create a super Nintendo, the 3DO adapter. And I'm, um, I reached out to the guy it was like 11 years ago, he posted it and out of nowhere, he replied to me and he actually uploaded the assembly code for it. And at the time I'd never, except for maybe a few college classes, never really programmed an assembly or never built a PCB or anything or 3d printed at that point. So that was very, very beginning. So I kind of just took his schematics and the list of parts he had and ordered them and wired it up on a breadboard. And eventually I got it working. And that's kind of where I first started sharing my progress on that and, I felt like ever since I started sharing the, the 3DO adapter, um, I started kind of drumming up and kind of connecting with a lot of these people that I have been following on Twitter for a long time and um, them kind of just letting me know that, hey, this is something. I honestly, I didn't think there was that many people with 3DOs, uh, but then suddenly hundreds of people were like, hey, I want that adapter. So that's kind of really how it just kicked off. And um, after I started posting that stuff, I got invited to a 3DO Discord and kind of got um, tied up with the 3DO community there. And just as a lot of cool guys and supportive and it's nice to, to work on some of these obscure consoles that just don't get enough love. Nice. 
Robert, did I understand that uh, you said that you're not working in the same position? I'm not trying to get into the details of your job, but uh, is this like, th- is this like almost full time? Did I understand or part time? Yeah. Or how much time does the controller stuff take for you now? Yeah, right now um, I've been doing it full time for about six months. Um, cool. So yeah, it's it wasn't really planned. Um, kind of just uh, at work, I've becoming more and more involved with this side project, and just became the thing that I was more passionate about and. I was just like, I just wasn't excited about what I was doing day to day. So decided to kind of dive off and see if I could make this work. Um, I had a lot of pre-orders, but just not enough time to assemble the adapters. So since then, it's just been a race to try to keep up with demand and try to like t- turn my products into something that I can assemble in a reasonable amount of time. That's really cool. And is that is the primary primary way you sell your stuff through the Shopify store? Is there anything else or well, that's it? Yeah, that's just just through Shopify, and I guess Twitter is pretty much my only marketing channel right now. Okay. Right. And that's amazing that in this community, that's like, you know, look, I guess you're working on a project right now. Who knows where this goes? Maybe it becomes something big. Maybe it doesn't. But I think that's great that you can have this experience and live from that and actually get to the stage where that's a cool idea that you can experiment with now. Yeah, still trying to grow the business so I can be sustainable long term. Uh, So I'm always... Mm always posting new ideas to see what kind of hooks to see what people are looking for. Um, I'm probably not going to keep the business going if I keep making new on adapters, but <laughs> I felt like that was one thing that really needed to, to happen. <laughs> yeah. I did right. notice in your timeline, there was a stretch of new on, uh, related content there. Yeah. You get, you went yeah, so, down um, that rabbit hole I'm thinking, right? Yeah, totally. I had several people asking me over and over. They're like, you should do the new one because it's just there's no options and the controllers are four hundred, five hundred dollars on eBay. So to play Tempest 3000, you got to use the remote and it's just impossible to play that way. <laughs> I'd never really even heard of it till a couple of years ago. Um, and I think a lot of other people, which has kind of been cool as I've been working on this and sharing it. I think more people are interested in learning about a platform they've never seen or heard of than actually trying to get it and play the games. So it's been kind of cool to just dabble with it, see what they tried to plan to do and try to make it, you know, be something more than it ever could have been. Can you, can you give us like the crash course on the new one? Like if, cause I don't, I mean, I'll be personally honest with you without your talking about it and like showing anything about it. I really don't have much knowledge of it. Even myself on the side. So, like, yeah, what would you say as to like, you know, just a, a, a brief, you know, whatever, put together information about this particular console? Well, uh, it was it was an interactive DVD player. So their, their idea was this is before the PS2. They wanted to they thought it would be great to have um, video games in a DVD player instead of a DVD player in a video game console. So I guess it was there's a huge audience at the time. Their business logic was there's so many DVD players in homes. If we could get that in there. That would be great. But I think the thing that's compelling about the nuance stuff is it's a lot of former um, Atari people who worked on the Jaguar. So it's some way sort of the spiritual successor. Um, Jeff Minter, uh, who worked on the original Tempest 2000, he worked at the same company and helped build Tempest 3000. And I think that's really the game that everyone's wanting to play is just that later ver- that version of the game that's um, only exclusive on that console. But the new one was kind of the same, I think, core concept that like the CDI was going for and the 3DO was just a kind of a central home entertainment console that could do games, video, pictures, everything. And they tried. It was only out for about, I think, a year and a half before they just totally canceled and sold the company off. Um, so I think there was like five games that were commercially released. So it's super limited. And I think that's a big reason that this just they're hard to find the controllers is they were only out for a short time and i think at the time no one really cared so they just kind of faded away until so it's one of those devices from that weird time in the console generation we didn't like know what was coming next they're like it's some video it's first person video look at all full motion it looks great and then we get it we're like yay night (laughs) trap and (laughs) this is it now and some of those things didn't live up to expectations um, totally. And they were really experimenting. And the new one is like a wild experiment as well. So rather than a games console putting DVD, we're going to take market it as a DVD player. Oh, do we, you know what happens to play games? Like wild ideas that yeah. have long been tested that don't work, but we were trying them back then. 
Yeah, I wouldn't so be these... surprised if most of these players, no one ever played a game on them because some of them, they still have the little cover for the ports and those things are probably <laughs> easily lost if you ever took them off. So I just assume if it's on there, no one ever played a game on it, <laughs> which is pretty sad. Yes, that's what I was going to say. All these are built into a DVD player, right? Or mm -hmm. is there an actual single unit ever made? Yeah, there was a, a Toshiba model and two um, Samsung models that came out in the U.S. And then there was a couple other Samsungs that came out overseas. Uh, I think there was one exclusive in Korea, which they have one exclusive game there that I still, that's the only one I haven't played. So I'm trying to track someone down in South Korea who can find me a new on game in the, in the console that it's region locked to. So. so what's the, what's the, what's that game? Like the one missing game from the new on, what is it called? Like what, and what's it supposed to be? Do you know? Uh, I don't, it's something crayon. It's like a popular game. I believe it's on other platforms. I think the same game okay. is on game boy possibly. So it's not like no one's ever played it, but yeah. it's just neat that it was this one game that, I just feel bad for the developers who ported this over and then it just like vanished into nothing. <laughs> you know? Well, that is true. There's no, um, there's no, there's no way to uh, Lewis and I often talk about a lot of these projects that, uh, the amount of research and development that you have to put into something like this, you know, it's not really something that you often get compensated monetarily with. It has to be something that you're passionate about and care about. And hopefully down the road, you know, as this stuff ages even more, there will become uh, a more of a, a historical and like preservation project, you know, as part of other things uh, attached to it so that, you know, this work can go on and help be helpful in that way, too. Hmm. But we often talk about how you're putting a lot of time in, right, that um, it's, it's all because you really care about it. Totally. Yeah. And this one, it was it was sort of a mix of just this console. I, I like to give the kind of obscure consoles that have been abandoned some love, but also just it was kind of a learning project. It was probably the most difficult controller protocol I could have tried to reverse engineer. And there were several weeks where I was just banging my head against the computer and I just didn't think it was going to be possible. But uh, enough time, you know, eventually I'll figure stuff out. Usually the way it goes. Uh, so. So in the meantime, and I don't, I don't know, like it's a meantime of all doing all this stuff as you're going. You're also, so you're working on the new on when, when, what else? I mean, you just had a newborn baby, right? Is this the same yeah. time you're working on this new on stuff? <laughs> yeah, I started it before the baby and I actually joked that I was going to name my daughter new on, but I didn't actually do that. <laughs> <laughs> but since it was kind of like my obsessed focus for the weeks leading up to the pregnancy or the birth, um, <laughs> It was a lot of uh, new on was on my mind, so. <laughs> oh, that's funny. But so, Robert, is your thing now the, the, the USB to PC? You've got some new uh, units coming out soon, did I understand? Is that the thing you're working on right now? Yeah, right now I've just opened up another um, a wave of pre-orders. Um, so I'm going to start assembling those. I'm going to shut it off in a week and then order the parts and have them out by May. And this will be the, the basic, I guess, the sort of third round, but the second big batch of them. Um, I first came out with them in October and had a lot of a uh, lot more people come for the PC engine than any other console. Um, mm -hmm. So I just wanted to make sure that I build another batch and get those out there to people. So okay, that's kind of been... how you do it, right? You take the pre-order, use that to then go and get the parts, make them and then ship them out in some sort of reasonable amount of time. And that so far, that model's been going well for you. Yeah, well, actually, up to this point, my model's been, I take free pre-orders. So basically, it's just sort of a pre-order intent. And then uh, I follow up with people once I have the actual parts on hand. Um, but this one, I've, I've, I already know how to assemble it. It's everything's known. There's no unknowns for this adapter. Um, so I know how long it's going to take to build them, how much it's going to cost, things like that. So um, rather than this time, I fork out the five grand to buy a bunch of adapters and that might not sell. Um, I went ahead and decided I'd go ahead and take pre-order ahead on this one. Um, this is going to be pretty straightforward, but, um, other adapters, if there's, especially if I just started to work on prototypes, I like to kind of just open up a pre-order to see if, if it's worth spending my time on. Um, cause if I get like 30 signups versus, you know, a thousand, it, it kind of gives me a direction of where to, to focus. Okay. You get some broad, just... some broad, uh, you know, directions out of this. Yeah. Or even if nothing is binding, you're looking for some some big trends there because i think right now yeah it's it's working well these people have made a pre-order it's a popular device but it's because you've built that trust in the community already that you did those other pre-orders you felt that on your conscience and for the reasons that you decided that hey i'll 
I'll do them in this fashion so people is cool. And now you've built that trust up and people are like, yeah, this guy seems pretty reasonable. He's done it before. Track record, track record is everything. And that's what I'm talking about with Conrad Beckman uh, in a couple of days on our next podcast. Like when he announced the, the uh, Pico um, flash cart project for the N64, no one had heard nothing about it before. And so everyone's like, oh, what can this guy do? Can he do it? But now it's a year uh -huh. later, he's got a track record. So you've got that track record as well. Okay, yeah, I think as long as you coming in, you put things out there, people, people will see it and tell others. And um, that was one thing when I started off, especially when I was just my first time doing it. I never wanted to be one of these. I've, I've been a customer on the other side who's put a pre-order in and then never heard anything. So I've never wanted to take anyone's money unless I, I know I'm going to deliver an awesome product and within a reasonable time frame. And that's, that's a tough. Yeah. That's a tough part of being a creator, right? To take that responsibility. Go ahead, Steve. Yeah. Well, I was going to say, like, let's just walk through this because this is a cool one. Um, since you're actually in the process, and if people are listening to this right now, they can go, and like, they still would have a little bit of time to submit, um, like, a pre-order for this round, right? Of mm -hmm. um, the PCE to P. Uh, sorry, what is it? Give me the full. <laughs> it's. I need to change the names on these, but it's USB <laughs> to PC Engine. <laughs> okay. USB to PC Engine. So you can hook up USB to the PC Engine, right? Correct. Yeah. PC. So, right. So, like, let's say, like, all right, just, just to give a little bit of plug here, how, you, you said you're doing this on different ways for pre orders. Like, for this one, is this something where you go to the Shopify website and you, like, click on there and it does the pre order? Or is this through, like, an email? Um, yeah, um, I'm actually uh, on the Shopify. I'm using a plugin for managing the pre-orders, okay. and uh, basically it's just a, a separate application that runs in Shopify that creates a list of all the pre-orders. So that's why it's easy for okay. me to go in, and I can, especially if I'm as I'm building them, I can send them off in the order that they came in. Um, mm -hmm. But generally, um, in the past, basically it was just an email list to people who said I want product A or B. Uh, where in this case, I'm actually collecting an order. And then once um, the, I get the parts built in May, um, I'll be just fulfilling all those and just using okay. Shopify pretty much 90% to, to manage all that and just the app for kind of collection of the pre-orders. There's a lot of different apps out like there. Sounds like doing it the right way. Yeah. yeah. I was going to say, and just to make sure that if you're watching this and you want this adapter, this is a great time to get on that and check that out through Shopify. So check out the link. We'll have one down in the description. Uh, but Let's Appreciate let's walk that. through about this product because you you know like you said this is kind of a newer business, so this particular product now is on a second order round, right? This is the second order. Or is this like beyond the second order? Yeah, I did a first batch of uh, fifty, and then uh -huh. um, in October I did five hundred. So now wow. I'm trying to see what we can ramp up to this another time. <laughs> yeah, so if I can do another five hundred. This, this that'd be has great, been a good but... so, but. Like, can you, can you kind of walk us through, you know, we, we talked about a little bit how you just started in the 3DO because that was more of like passion project. Same thing with the new one. But the PCE is mm -hmm. obviously something that is a little bit better on the end of having a market available to sell these devices to, right? So, like, what? Yeah. Obviously, it's been like an incremental thing there. So, like, what, what originally piqued your interest in that particular project? And like, how long did that take to develop to where you got to like that first run? Do you mind talking about that at all? Yeah, totally. Um, it was, I think, um, around the end of last summer, uh, I saw some tweets about people wanting to use the 8-bit dough PC engine 2.4G uh, USB controller on an actual PC engine. Um, I guess they only designed these for use on like a PC or, or on the actual mini PC engines. Um, so I just kind of was like replied to someone who'd bought my adapter before and was like, kind of like, don't threaten me. I'll do it. You know, like just kind of joking. And then I noticed that there was a lot of responses and people were like, yeah, that would be really awesome. So, um, over a weekend, I just kind of threw together just a simple little prototype with some boards I had laying around and it wasn't, the latency was terrible on it, but I kind of had just a little video to show that it worked. And then, um, I opened a pre-order right after that, um, just, uh, the free pre-order, and then when I posted it, I got a, almost a thousand people signed up for it. So I was like, all right, this is, this is something that a lot of people are going to want. So, um, and it was about the same time that I was thinking about leaving my job. So, um, as soon as I left, I was like, all right, this is, this is what I got. So I just kind of ran a hundred percent with it and, um, just ordered a huge amount of them. Um, it was kind of a big risk as well. Cause I wasn't sure if even if half of those people were going to come through, um, on the free pre-orders. 
And that's kind of another reason I've shifted on this latest one is just a, this is a solid product. I just want to make sure that whatever I order, I'm going to get out. I'm not going to have too much excess inventory. Sure. How, but, and how did that um, yeah, go just, that first time when you were judging? How did you judge? Pretty close or not so good? Or how was it? Um, well, I'm glad that I only uh, ordered enough for half of those pre orders. So I had 1,000 pre orders and I ordered parts for 500. So, and that was a good uh, amount. 500 was a nice amount first time. Yeah. Pretty much right away. Everyone was the pre-orders were fulfilling. And then I had like a, maybe the last 50 or a hundred kind of trickled out since then. Yeah. That's good, man. That's, that's uh, you, you picked it well because you're right. Anytime you give something away, like a free ticket as I have, or in my comedy events, a free ticket isn't quite worth the same as a free ticket for a few euros or something like that. It makes a big difference. So that's nice that, yeah, you calculate in. It's like if you have a Facebook event, you got to work out, well, 10 people attending means 15 people show up or something. Yeah, okay, exactly. nice, nice, nice. Yeah, and it, it right. sort of learned from the 3DO project. I did something similar, but those uh, adapters take me over an hour to assemble each one. So like I've got basically more pre-orders piling up than I could probably ever assemble. Uh, right now, I'm actually actively working on redesigning that or possibly just doing a USB to 3DO adapter. Um, just something that there's still a huge need there. People want controllers for 3DO, but, uh, there's no way I can build a sustainable business if it's taken me an hour to hour and a half to, to fill each order. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That, and that's, I think that is a good, and, a good place to go is that, is that marketplace where there's, there's not the, the 3DO has always had a tough time getting good controllers. Yeah, and it's 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 pretty cool because once you get an adapter into it you, with the daisy chain feature, you could use a USB hub, and then you got one adapter, and you could hook up eight controllers or more. So that was kind of one thing that, that kind of caught my interest there. But yeah, one reason that that initial product is takes so long to assemble is because it was my first PCB to ever design, and wow. I'd made it so that everything's through hole, so that I could actually like order all the parts, and put it together by hand, because uh, I'd never done any soldering that that small at that point at least. Uh, but I've learned my lesson and learned that there's PCB manufacturing and assembly companies will do it for you. Um, so it's worth forking out the extra so what, money. What do you to reckon you can get that down to? What What are you expecting the final amount of build time to be once you optimize it? What do you reckon? Well, the, the PC engine adapter only takes me like maybe five minutes or less to build. And I think I could get that down even more because I'm, I'm using a dev board on it right now. So there's about 20 pins I got to solder. And then plus the connectors. So it's, it's pretty easy and straightforward to do. Um, the 3DO one, there's so many components. It takes it half the time just sticking the components in the board. Like I've got my mom and my wife over here helping me. And they're at the point where they're like, I don't want to look at it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so everyone who's asked for 3DO adapters, I'm sorry, I'm trying. <laughs> Sounds like a thing yeah. to do one. If you can go an hour and a half down to five minutes, that's okay. That's good business. Yeah. But I think I think that you made a good point right there to kind of shift over. If you could get that down to being the similar to the PCE project, even if it's going to USB, and you're getting that like easy to add a USB hub, that's that's pretty cool uh, for the daisy chain effect in those uh 3do games and uh, the way the controller was built originally mm -hmm. so, yeah and then with uh, bro, the, um, what is the super main... nintendo adapter Sorry, go i was gonna say the super nintendo adapter i'd also implemented the the multiplayer so you can use multi-taps you can mm -hmm. actually hook, hook up two super nintendo multi-taps and do eight players so that's one thing with each adapter if there's any multi-tap support i'd like to implement that with my usb side of things Cool. Now speaking Sorry of that, to cut you off Robert there, sent me no, 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 not at all. I, I was interested in your point. So Robert sent me recently uh, some samples of his handiwork because I was really into the Damon Byte controllers using an Arduino Pro Micro to connect to SNES or whatever. So wait, where'd those PCBs go? Ah, oh, they're right here. So so anyway, the like as finish it up on these then. You say, when is the last day to, to pick up and get on that pre-order? Um, I'm the... planning to cut it off on the on the yes. first, depending on how on much first. come in. Oh, yeah. okay. okay. I might keep so it open a little be... longer if I end up ordering mm -hmm. more than, than my pre-orders. Mm -hmm. uh, but if I max, if I get to 500 pre-orders, I'll probably just cut it off there um, and then do another round after that. That's fair enough. There's only so many you can service in one go. Yeah. Were you able to find uh, those PCBs? Yeah. 
I found it. Here we go. So wait, now how can I? Now we can't get blurry. There we go. <laughs> Ooh, almost. Okay, there we go. Better. So this on one side is supposed to take the Arduino Pro Micro, and the other side takes a Super Nintendo controller plug that'll flop in the top. So which which microcontroller do you recommend, Robert? I use right now. Um, I've actually um, I've moved on to using the what's called the KB twenty forty, uh, which is a okay. by Adafruit, and it's got the Pico Pi in it. Uh, so I've kind of moved on from the Arduinos um, to a, a board that has a similar footprint, and it'll still work on there. Um, but with this, uh, the KB more what? powerful Raspberry Pi KB twenty forty. Oh right, and it's got the same footprint as the Pro Micro, um, except it's got the the same processor as in the uh, Pico Pies. Uh, so it's a more capable board than the Pro Micro, and this is good. For... Definitely, yeah. I mean, it's a hundred thirty three okay, megahertz me though, dual core. If... Look, and that's super cool though. But why does it? Why is it better for my uh, uh, the Damon Byte style controller to USB? Like, do we really need? twin cores just for a super nintendo controller um probably not for that i think for the basic of implementation it's fine uh, but one reason i've moved over to that is because there's this pretty cool um library called gp 2040 and it's uh basically it's a library so you can build custom controllers and, and that's what i applied to the fisher price controller actually um but it has <laughs> good segue it has okay, really good usb yeah, support okay. built in so it's like one millisecond latency um and then plus it can do um, switch, um, standard you know, USB controller, and X input. So work on a lot of different devices. So with the the, the firmware I have for the Arduino, it's pretty basic. Um, it I either you can either install the hide one, um, hide USB, or you can do the X input one. Uh, but with this new library, or the, it's new to me, uh, can do a lot of different stuff all in one. So it's sort of like um, an 8-bit dough controller where you hold a specific button when you plug it in. And then it'll switch into like switch mode or PC mode. So that's kind of one reason I'm going down that route. And um, I really like the the Pico Pi board. So it's kind of a personal preference, I guess. Mm. Uh, but it's kind of cool that it works on the same board that um, I did even design it for. <laughs> right. That, that, that form factor, that long elongated form factor mm -hmm. is now a thing is where our boards are at. Okay. So thanks very much, Matt. It was the nice thing part. The nice part was that it's just a couple of these, so it was very cheap to post over because I live out here on the, uh, yeah, right. of the United States of wherever. <laughs> so. What? so let's get into your latest work that you're working on because, I mean, uh, we were joking. You just had a daughter, and how old is she now? Um, just like um, about. We're just is about three months. Yet, or three, oh, three months. Wow, so really young. So. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so, we just started. I saw, I saw, you know, you post about this Fisher Price controller, and I was just laughing, thinking, "Oh, you just got it for your daughter." <laughs> and then I started seeing all these follow-ups with, like, you're talking about <laughs> that uh, that Pico, and like in the device, and did all the wiring it up, and doing all these tests, and, and watching you play. What were you playing, Wipeout or something <laughs> with with the? Uh, Sorry, or Hydro Thunder or something. I can't remember what were you playing with the with yeah, the I controller. Yeah, I think it's called a, it making all the kids noises, the Fisher Price noises. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's called a NG Ballistic, and it's like a Wipeout clone. Uh, you get it on Steam. Uh, just a fun game that it's easy to test and something you normally wouldn't play with a controller like that. Uh, but yeah, the I'd seen someone else on Twitter um, doing something. I think there's another YouTuber. I think Rudism is his name, and he's he's done some videos where he's modded it and played a bunch of PC games with it. So I was like, hey, that looks fun. Um, so I got one in, and as soon as I got it, I realized that there's actually a PCB in there with buttons. So I, I ripped it open, and there's actual solder points that you can easily connect the wires to. So I was like, I got to do this. <laughs> uh, but so this I, I ended up taking that. It's not as much that... of a toy as it first appears. Or what, yeah. is it, what is its original functionality? Is it supposed to be any sort of controller to begin with? <laughs> it's um, I well, I didn't know what this was, so I've had a kid. But there's a lot of these sensory toys, and just it makes sounds and colors, um, and sets off the senses. So it's okay. it's part of the Fisher Price, like uh, I think it's called Live and Learn or something like that. But it's basically it teaches you colors, shapes, numbers. Mm -hmm. So every time you press a button, it's annoyingly making a lot of different <laughs> sounds to teach the kids. So. 
when you actually hook it up as a controller, I left that functionality on with the speaker. <laughs> so it's just like every button press, there's a different color flashing and some other little happy sound coming out of it. <laughs> what could you so say of the hilarious. D-pad? Is it a proper D-pad there? Or what it looks those it's not great. It, it works, but it's not great. I think I need to open it up and see if I can improve. Because the way I ran the wiring, it, it might be bumping into the plastic piece. So I'm going to say maybe that's why. But at least the down left is not very good. But <laughs> those diagonals are always what get you. Can't hit but the uh, I was playing a lot of games Street last Fighter night Six. with it. <laughs> you play a lot of what? I need to, I need to try Street Fighter. That's usually my go-to test for when I'm doing the controller adapters. Is if I pull off mm. the moves, then I know I've got pretty good latency. <laughs> So are you is it your goal to have like the youngest uh controller game game controller? You'll have developed <laughs> the perfect for controller for like the one year old to two to three year old new gaming. Because uh, everybody sure. wants their kids to be gaming when they're younger, you know. That's all. Definitely. That's young parents. Mm, this is the next target market. Very clever, yeah. Robert. I don't have, Sell yeah. this. To Wait till, adult retro right. gamer man. Oh, yeah, man. Yeah, he buys and just another child. reason to make your wife mad at you. That's what we call it. That segment of product. I'll, <laughs> well, I definitely need to build in a switch to turn the sounds off if, if I'm going to make more of them. <laughs> You're going to be. But, and this controller, it has this turny knob thing on it. Did you hook that up as a spinner or something? Uh, Did I see? Yeah, I see. Here we go. Yeah. yeah, yeah it's yeah, actually... Yeah. Um, What's the blue thing? It does spin, but it's it's just really... It's just a button. Uh, okay. Like I, the other YouTuber I seen who modded this, he actually put a joystick in there. So that's kind of my future. I want to actually wire up these buttons on the top because um, there's there's two different buttons here. Oh, yeah. Or I guess you could do four buttons potentially. Um, so I could get two, uh, four more bumper buttons and an analog stick in there, and I think we got a pretty full working controller. Oh my goodness! Yeah. But um, for a yeah, that's right now it's just a button, so I just wired it up to be the start button. Start button for now. So, yeah, that's a. Yeah. Can you hold that up again? That thing is crazy. If you don't mind. Just to show us one more time. Yeah. Yeah. Look at that. I took yeah, the I'm batteries out, so it's not thumbnail. making any noise, but. <laughs> so, as long as there's batteries in it, then. Yeah, and I put some little holes in the back, too. Okay. Oh, that's so you can so get to awesome. some USB port here. It's funny. And then the reprogram, you have to hold the boot button when you plug it in. Uh, so I had to drill a little hole in the back to get to it, but uh, there was, it's really, there's no plan here for this controller. Like I wasn't trying to make a new product or anything. It just was just a fun project that I see things on Twitter and I'm like, I got to do that. And now I'm like looking at all kinds of kids toys, trying to think of what to do next. But it's, it's been, oh, I, I think I got 700 likes the last I looked at it. So several wow. people are like, I want a kit. So maybe. <laughs> <laughs> There you go, maybe. Get push it up. Push up the interest here. Yeah, you Just need to sell them on that. your shop. And, and Robert, did I notice that you've got a nice little thing going on where cuz you had to for example, you bought the Astro City controller, but then did I see that you then unsold it on your website, which is a nice way to make it work. Did I understand is that how it worked? Yeah, um I especially with the USB um, adapter, I have a lot of people who are like, I want to use this specific controller. And a lot of them I have like the individual vendor and product IDs developed into the firmware. So I have to like map out the, the controller, what buttons go to what and get the actual ID into my firmware before it'll work. So um, that was just one controller. Someone reached out to me and I could even get it in the U S I had to sign up for um, an account on Amazon in Spain and order it. <laughs> um, but I got it in and it works. And actually it's like ma the mapping was very similar to some other Sega USB controllers. So I just like had to add the product ID to my firmware and it was working. Um, but then I, I've acquired all these controllers and I just, I like them and I love them, but I just don't use them because I just have too many. So that's where, um, um, January I started giving them away every week. I've been having a, a giveaway on my, um, Twitter feed. So every Wednesday so far this year, it's, it's been going. And that's kind of how it starts. Okay. It's just these controllers that I, I like. I love them, but I just am never going to use them. It's just how many so, that I'm getting. Oh, you give away the controllers? I thought you yeah. sold the controllers. No, oh. no, they're actually listed on my website uh, because I mm. I'll I'll list them on there and then I'll send you like a free checkout. So it's basically a hundred percent discount on the item, and that way it just makes it easier for me to do the the tracking and um, creating the shipping label and everything. 
That's wow. That's really great of you to to unsell them afterwards. I'm mean, sorry to to give them away. It's a very nice thing. Cool, man. That's why you've got yeah, the code for the like Twitter that. tracking. <laughs> Yeah, what? people like free yeah. shit. Who'd have thought? People, who'd have thought? <laughs> people like free stuff. All right, so I've seen some of your posts, and I know you have. Is it an eight inch PVM? Yep. What yeah, do you I got, got an eight inch what and, you a, got and a twenty. CR, what kind of CRTs you got? Show us what you um, got. Uh, I got uh, two PVMs. <laughs> I got the eight inch actually on eBay um, a couple years ago, just because I see like your videos, you repairing all these TVs. I was like, I want to get one. And, um, I was playing on that thing for a while with no problem. Um, eventually I found someone on Craigslist and I picked up a 20 inch Sony PVM, uh, for 50 bucks, but it was the oh. 20 inch PVM and a 13 inch PVM. Uh, oh, it's a GVM actually, but, um, it's got a little issue. So I keep it down in the garage, but the PVM, I use it quite a bit. The 20 inch pretty much all my development, Excellent. I unnecessarily use this big big screen <laughs> yeah, that's beautiful yeah that's the that's the height of crt culture Mwah, my favorite good stuff yeah but um other than that like um in my game room i have a 27 inch um sony just uh old crt Ooh. from i think 94. so the black style so black i'm always plastic. browsing craigslist looking for a deal mm. yeah what's that because that's pretty new, ninety four. I mean, sorry, well, fairly. I was gonna say that's like, the, say, that's like the black plastic shell, right? Okay, isn't yep. it? Yeah, Robert. Yeah, yeah. Because it's like pre silver plastic, which was more two thousand, uh, and then yeah, yeah, after yeah. the wood grain era of plastic and wood. We we'll often talk about that. Like, if you could, we we're talking about this last time. If you could like make a CRT look like what? What would it be for you? Like, is it? if the screen was the same, would you want something that do you like the look of that nineties TV or is it more like a uh, wood grain or is there anything that, or you just don't even care <laughs> <laughs> just as long as it works. I don't know. Uh, do I, I guess it doesn't matter. Yeah. I guess I, I grew up in the nineties. So that, that kind of the black one was what appealed to me. Uh, I guess a little bit before the silver, because that's kind of later on the, the CRT time. Uh, it only has S video, mm -hmm. and it's kind of funny because I spent all this time and money going full RGB on everything and setting up my PVM, and then now I just use S video on my my bigger <laughs> monitor that I have. <laughs> what do you use to downscale into S video? Uh, well, the, the, I just on my CRT, I'm just using um, my game room. It's just for like retro consoles, so just oh, everything's running at 240p. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny, isn't it, that, that hit of nostalgia? My buddy Jay and I, we lived together, and we had a 21-inch black screen. Well, he had it, and because that's how Share House works. And, uh, yeah, that, for me, is still a beloved color. But I, I do like, just aesthetically like the silver. But, Steve, correct me if I'm wrong. Didn't I understand, by the time they got to the big silver TVs, the geometry was getting pretty wobbly or had a high chance of becoming wobbly. Yeah, What's your well, experience? if you if you go over like 24 inches, they were pretty rough uh, for like the mm. flat screen ones. I remember uh, just the it was about 2001 to two. And it was a same probably situation like you. I had a roommate in college who his parents were real rich. And they came in the you know with this fancy Trinitron box and unveiled this beautiful silver set, which was the first one I'd seen outside of like probably a Best Buy or something. And uh, so yeah, most of my stuff would have been about the same time as you know the just the classic kind of cheaps grays, some silvers on like this Toshiba's or something. But yeah, that silver was more around that two thousand one time period and if you go over that mm. on a flat screen it does look like donkey wonky sides yeah i remember picking up one of those from walmart in like 2005 for my brother for christmas so i got him a, a big tv we freaking mounted that thing up on the wall i don't know how that thing was even staying up there it was like almost a 30 inch crt and we had it up on some wall mount <laughs> it swiveled around <laughs> Those are crazy days. <laughs> I've been looking yeah. for one of those wall mounts for a long time. And, oh, yeah. And, you know, you go, I, 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 the closest I found was like three quarters of a kit at a Goodwill. And I was like, this is way too dodgy to trust with like, yeah. anybody around near it. That's 
but then I'll go into a place and it will have one of those that's just not even turned on. It's still got like a CRT in it that's just mm. covered in dust and left in the way up in the rafters kind of as like a security <laughs> deterrent, I guess, from 20 yeah. years ago. And uh, you just laugh thinking, well, that that held it there forever. And it will <laughs> until they bring the building down. Yeah, it's just too heavy to get down. I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe just leave it there. Right, that that looks like security. But yeah, like it looks like. I mean, I feel I feel the same. If I were to put a rack on the wall, I feel like I, I have to reinforce the house or something to stop the house from tipping <laughs> over. With the wet, like, I'm very concerned yeah. about the modern screw, construction the screwdrivers. Yeah, yeah up situation. A CRT on a wall. Yeah, mm-hmm. it might take the whole wall straight down. Right. Um, so, Robert, like, what's going on now? What's what is is the horizon like? Um, for you, you know, what like you're working on this order. Is there uh, anything that you're secretly working on that you're, you're gonna you're okay talking about, or anything like that? Not secretly working on for the next big thing. Yeah, totally. It- um, well, I guess right now I'm just getting ready to put out the new batch of the PC Engine, and then um, the USB uh, new on adapter. Um, I had made some slight changes to the board, so it's a little bit delayed. Um, so I'm just waiting for those to come in. And then, um, so probably around the same time, I'll be fulfilling those orders in May. Um, and But right now, I'm kind of taking the the USB stuff that I've wrote for originally the PC Engine and then now port it over to the new one. And it's becoming kind of a common library that I think I can keep porting to different consoles. So I've already kind of started work on porting that to CDI and 3DO. Um, I have some just kind of basic breadboard stuff put together for those. So basic working example, I just need to get a PCB, design a case and kind of just turn it into a product for people, something I can assemble. So that's just what I'm working on right now. Um, partially because the 3DO, there's still a lot of unmet demand there. And the CDI, I keep telling everyone I'm gonna make an adapter for in a year now. Um, so it started with a Super Nintendo, the CDI adapter, which kind of built on the existing open source project. And then it just keeps getting backburnered. So uh, definitely those are the next ones I'm working on. Um, or actively working on now, but um, I've really been kind of looking at what's the next console. And um, the other day, I joked that I asked ChatGPT, and it told me to do Dreamcast, um, which there are <laughs> there is a USB to Dreamcast adapter, uh, but I still need to explore to see if maybe there's there's more options that maybe it's not filling. Um, maybe full mouse and what keyboard support. What adapter is that? What's the one you're talking about? The USB to Dreamcast, new or old one? It's it's new. It's by Brook. Um, accessories oh, okay. it's actually yeah i think it's just for like usb controllers like uh, xbox P- ps4 and then it has mm-hmm. keyboard support but beyond that i'm not sure like i'd love to do mouse support and all the little things that the dreamcast supports um on its um i guess the maple bus protocol so that's, that's kind of the fun part to diving in to see like what was what did the original developers <laughs> intend for this thing to do and what never got implemented so those are kind of the things i'd like to look at but I'm also kind of thinking about GameCube as well, but I get it really depends on um, what people reach out and tell me what they want. So anyone listening, tell me what you're looking for and I'll definitely look into it. How often do you ask chat GPT (laughs) (laughs) for advice? And what Uh, else have you asked chat GPT (laughs) that we should know about? Mm, Um, I've asked a lot of things. How have you learned? Yeah. (laughs) Good. Yeah. Um, Good well, night. I just started using it maybe a, a couple of weeks ago, um, and I like already feel like I'm out of the loop that I haven't started using it sooner because I think it came out maybe five months ago, or at least started going kind of mainstream. Um, it could do a lot of stuff, and it's not perfect. I guess like any person, we're not perfect, but you always got to take what it says with a grain of salt. Uh, but what it can do is pretty amazing, um, especially as a developer or programmer. Um, I think the key is like knowing what to ask it to do. Um, so if you're a developer or you know something about electronics or anything specific case and you could ask it the right thing, like as if you're talking to another person, with your own skill set, you could get it to pump out um, real code. Maybe it learned from stolen code because that's kind of the pushback I got was that where did it steal the code? But mm. I've asked it to make some pretty unique things that, that couldn't have came from anywhere. It may be pieced it together based on knowledge of other things, but... It's pretty wild. Um, actually, the the firmware for the um, USB or the Super Nintendo to USB adapter that board you got, the first firmware I wrote was ChatGP wrote all the code. I just asked it about how does the Super Nintendo controller work? 
it described it pretty well. And I was like, Hey, this is not right. And it's like, Oh, I'm sorry. And it actually was like, <laughs> you're right. It's, it works this way. And then I was like, can you convert it to, um, can you write me Arduino code that'll convert that those data signals in and then out to USB? And it was like, sure. And instantly just shot back an example code. Now the, the code I like actually put together the board to test it and it was mostly all the buttons, but one worked. So there was just something slightly off with its implementation. But uh, since then, I've asked it to do a lot of other things as far as programming or circuit design. Like I needed to make a digital analog converter and I was like asking it for which components I can use, um, which components are better than others. So I asked it to make a list of parts I needed for my bomb for a project I'm working on. And we just kind of went through and... <laughs> I just keep going on. It's pretty so it's like amazing. A little um, mini, it's do. like a mini assistant. Are you yeah, considering yeah, something amazing. like that? Because this is kind of yeah, what I like... was thinking about. What is the future for like the AI? And like, I feel like that next step is almost like you have a personal assistant uh, on a certain level of how you learn how to communicate with that assistant. And like what you're doing specifically almost highlights this. You're asking it to do specific jobs that you know it can do. And, and it's, and it's actually given you good results. Yeah. And even when it doesn't give me good results, like you can push back and it'll make changes to the code or, or even try to correct it. But I definitely had it, I pushed it pretty far and, and sometimes it'll, I'll ask it to change something and it'll break something else. So it's kind of depends on how far you go down the rabbit hole. But I, I like to keep in mind that this is just like the, the first public version they have here. Um, like what else have they not released to the public that they're working on and where's this going to go in 10 years from now? I think it's going to be really awesome. And yeah. I recommend anyone right now, just, just talk to it, ask it about what you work on or ask it about anything, <laughs> ask about life. Ooh. You know, it has, it, it'll, will, it'll come, yeah, up with it's come up with thousand <laughs> CRT questions to see what it says. Yeah. How did you, you generate good questions for it? I'm struggling to know, like I leave the chat window open, but I don't even know what to ask it like of what i'm working on what was robert your process of like thinking like oh actually yeah i will ask chat gdp that okay i can do that did you make have to make it conscious good we uh when i first got it i kind of opened it and i was like any other chat bot i've tried i was like i don't know what to say i was like hello you know we're just kind of like hello, having theory. some simple conversation um and then i started just asking about conspiracy theories and what does it think about certain things? And I was like, will humans ever accept the robots in the future? And we went in this long <laughs> philosophical discussion of how humans and AI will work together in the future. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's kind of, it started off really kind of as programming questions, I think that got it for me. Um, just, I have a mm. background in web development. So I was like, asked it to do very specific things, like make me a node backend server that pulls from the Twitter API um, so that I could do my contests that I run every week. And it was able to get me an example there. And then I was like, hey, can you make me a React front end um, that looks like this with these certain things? And it pumped it out. And I was like, can you put it all together for me? And it just even wrote me the readme file on how to set it all up. So once I saw that, I was like, wow, this is things that like would take me maybe hours or days to do. It did instantly. So I don't think it's going to replace me or other programmers or anything like that anytime soon. But I think it's going to really be like an amplifier for a lot of people. Cause if you can really ask it the right questions, it can at least get you to the information you're looking for faster than, than Googling it. Um, but then you always got to take with a grain of salt cause I've had it just totally make things up. I've asked it about the new one. I guess it doesn't have enough information about it, but it was talking about all these features that the controllers had that it doesn't. So <laughs> it's really good at just kind of saying what is the most likely thing that should come next in the sentence. And somehow it comes up with these answers that are amazing. And then other times it's just total BS. So, <laughs> did, and I think a lot you... of the stuff in the news is people are like kind of setting it up. They're like, oh, the AI wanted to escape the computer. I was like, well, you probably talked about it, about a dystopian future scenario where you Man. can tell the AI to pretend it's in this future world. And what would it do? And it'll write back or whatever you ask it. So it's, it's a pretty powerful tool. And I'm really interested to see where, where we can go. So I'm always trying to tinker with it and see what else I can make it do. Steve, have you used it? I've not used it. No. See, I feel like, 
I, I, yeah, I, I don't know if I'd ever get past the conspiracy stage. I might never come out of my. <laughs> I might start asking that thing, and I might never come out of this basement <laughs> again. <never> leaving. <laughs> the, it's just the dogs. The dogs the are the dogs, only people allowed downstairs anymore. The dogs anymore. just running up and down the stairs. That's it. So, no, I, I well, find I'm, it very fascinating because I was sitting around trying to think, what is that next level? And to me, it does sound like it. And and I was even thinking about um, other other avenues, like even what we're we're doing. I, I joke with Lewis. I'm like. Let's just give it some wacky ideas and and tell it to come up with a script for us for like a video and just give it like some weird premises. But again, I've never even messed with it. So I'm not like a good example because I've not tried it yet. But this has intrigued me to probably play with it some more. Yeah, definitely. um, Yeah, there's the chat um, dot eight uh, open com. you can go to for the main one that everyone's using but Microsoft also is a big um, person behind this company and they baked it into Bing and the cool thing is if you sign up for the Bing chat um, it actually is connected to the internet so the difference is the chat GPT on um, open AI's website it's it only knows information up till September I think 2022 where Bing is mm-hmm. connected to real information right now so you can ask it like who is Robert Dell Smith and it'll it's it said I was known for my controller giveaways and I was like I just started doing those (laughs) (laughs) oh man that's but everything else is pretty accurate it knew where I lived it knew about my career (laughs) so that's the scary thing is when you start I mean so Lewis yes that that's a future episode us just sitting there live chat GPTing each other reading back reading back what each thing says like i'll do i'll look you up and you can look (laughs) me up from estonia and see what it says that'll be yeah but i think it would be cool to go ahead dale you could totally write a uh, like a script for it um you could i think the key is just be as verbose as possible like just start Mm -hmm. a prompt and tell it everything so i wanted to make a a web-based game and i was like i want a game that does this the, it, there's a soccer ball that moves around the screen. I just like wrote this long paragraph. And then I feel like the more verbose you are with it, you could get a really good response. So I bet if you described your your podcast and what you wanted to, to talk about and who you two are as individuals, it could try to like just pump back a script for you. And it would be funny to see where, how it goes. Yeah, that would be funny. <laughs> just like we're doing it, the script today. And it's like... <laughs> You could also do a show, maybe you just interview it, you know, just ask it questions and and go back and forth and, you know, see how that goes. I can't, I can't wait till this is connected to some kind of voice like Alexa or Siri or something. Right, right, right. That's what I was thinking too. This is, see, this is, um, oftentimes I feel like, ah, it would have been awesome, like to start doing social media things like this a decade ago, right? When things are in more of that infancy stage. And I really can't, I don't know, Lewis, and maybe Robert, you guys can think of something. I don't know that I can think of much of anything else that's really um, in much of that infancy stage as it seems like as this is that has a potential to actually be as Well, big. you never know at the start. Right, that's, that's the thing, the you thing. never yeah. know. When but you, this when feels you're buying, like it may be it's something big. When it's, when it's the year 2000 and you're walking through Best Buy and you see the new one on the shelf, you don't <laughs> understand the legend it will turn into one day. You don't know at the time is my point maybe maybe not <laughs> totally i think you got a good point there steve i think this this might be like one of the biggest things we've probably in our lifetimes it, it could be really huge and i think there's a lot more applications that could be applied to than just making video game adapters and asking it crazy questions um so it's gonna be really interesting to see over this next year um especially with all these companies they're now building plugins for chat gpt so you can connect it to like your shopify store or or github or who knows what other developers will come up with to, to leverage this. Um, I've even seen some coding stuff where it's built into the, into the, your IDE. So you can say you could highlight a piece of code and get it to describe it to you, give you suggestions or tell you how it works. Usually things as a developer, I'm sitting, spending hours reading documentation and digging through code. And now I can just tell me instantly. That's it's pretty exciting. So I don't know why anyone's afraid of losing their job when it can do a lot of the basic things I've done as a web developer, but... I think I could do so much more with it. So it's really, really awesome. It's really useful as a tool to, to certain, I think, like you said, it, it saves you an immense amount of time 
of having to search for answers and then test those answers to find out if they're even a good answer, if you should have skipped them all together. And then I feel like, too, that even with certain stuff, um, what's the future for, like, troubleshooting, right? I mean, if you have problems with a device, sh you should eventually be able to troubleshoot through how to fix it or get it working again with a with a um with the open chat you know program that's connected to the internet like my old man one day talk. it'll fix our satellites one day. one day one day it'll replace it'll just watch my videos <laughs> right. in an instant when will it become it? conscious see it's one thing to just watch the or read the article copy the instructions verbatim sort of turn them up but when does the ai watch enough of steve's videos and absorb enough online articles about crts that it can determine it's it will work out how a crt works it's absorbed all of steve's knowledge and then it'll come up with new innovative solutions for how to fix it. it'll tell you everything how to fix a crt what there you go maybe i a long time ago i kind of imagined that one day if we had this kind of ai that potentially we'd all have sort of like a subconscious ai that's constantly analyzing everything we see and hear and think and potentially like giving us ideas on what to do next so so you could be working on something real time and you got this voice in your back of your head it's like steve you need to you need to check this piece here or, you know, just anything in our life. Yeah, that sounds like my anxiety. What? Day -day <laughs> that, what? Yeah. Another voice in my head? Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, join the queue. I'll hook but then, you yeah, the but pull another level of conspiracy theory head. there, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, that's, yeah I, uh... I tend to be kind of optimistic about tech, and I think it's going to help us overall. There's always going to be a bad side. And yeah. it, it, I get bummed when I see stuff about the future, and it's always sad and scary, and the robots are going to kill us, and... It's like no, actually, I think the robots are going to make the world better. So, I think well, it's, the it's really up to what been we do out with since it. the '80s, right? So it's we've lasted this long, and it's that's actually it. that's proof you know, right there. We've yeah. lasted this long since the '80s. Yeah. So what, what's next? I mean, I don't know what. Well, <laughs> um, ultimately, optimistic guy that <laughs> I'll be the optimistic guy that ends up causing the robots to to take over the world. So <laughs> we'll see what happens. Exactly. You gave them enough prompts. You gave them enough coding prompts. <laughs> that the, uh, the chat GDP worked figured it out. All the, Thanks a lot. The secret has always been in the controller uh, code of the Nuon. That's always been right. the secret. <laughs> when yeah. chat GDP absorbed the Nuon code, it became fully sentient. But is it, that was is the that, last piece. Is that something, though, that now we should be thinking about that when we're working on this stuff, we really are contributing to something possibly like that, right? I mean, right? Our, our work that we're putting out there does, now can contribute to whatever this machine AI thinks is right. Kind of like a Wikipedia almost, right? Mm, how do totally, you feel yeah. about that? I think that's why it's, AI is feeding. Yeah, I think that's one reason it's really good at programming because there's just an immense amount of information online and documentation about all these different libraries and example code. So it's really good at that. So I think as it absorbs more um, content on the internet and video, it's we're actually teaching it in the future. It's, it, but I think that's where it gets the wrong answers too, is it's <clears throat> it's taking in information that we've created and the stuff that we put on the internet's not always correct either, so. That's kind of funny idea that we're a human and we're making video content with audio and video. And then on the other end, it's a computer that's just gonna analyze that to try to work out our thoughts or habits or something like that. I was thinking the other day uh, about this thing with like the same idea with tele with fax services. Cause I mean, you know, there's a service you can send an email and it turns into a fax, right? They've got actual mm -hmm. modems with actual fax machines hooked up to this thing. But why can't I then just have two services faxing each other? So I send an email in, it goes to the modem, goes over the phone line to another fax service that just takes the digital, makes an email, gives it to me. I want to I wanna set that up just for the fun of knowing that I sent a digital fax. It's the same thing. Why are we making videos just for the computer to have to visually understand it? I don't know. Then one day it might pump out videos regurgitating <laughs> you know <laughs> how many videos yeah right it's like i that's so funny i've been going down i don't know why uh but the the i've watched a bunch of videos on um 
I have no mouth, but I must scream. Are you familiar with this uh, short it's story? Game. It's an old game. Yeah, it's oh. an old DOS game. Mm-hmm. And it's based on this short story. And the whole thing is about this AI machine that was built. Like, what ends up happening in this dystopian sci-fi short story is uh, the the world morphs from the Cold War era into World War Three, And finally, there's like this advanced AI military machine developed computer, supercomputer. And each country finally gets one and and it's called AM AM. And anyway, it goes every country gets one. It finally gets to the point where in like Terminator we're all become sentient and it decides to use its whole war powers, that's what it was made for war, to kill every human except for five. And then there's five humans that it leaves around and it like tortures for eternity. Jeez. Because it's used its AI like machine to make like pods for the humans to make them heal so it just does small tortures to keep them alive and that's the whole short story right it's like one of the darkest sci-fi things ever and 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 it's just but it's really grim about how ai uh just with the way it was programmed it just has this Mm. all it does is hate humanity it's like it just hates humanity Steve, and, why were uh, you thinking of this? Why would you think of this particular book? This one, it, it just showed up <laughs> a, a, a subscription feed for like somebody uh, who did an, an analysis of it. And I was like, oh, that's a really good, interesting topic. I've heard of that. Mm-hmm. And then I found out that there was a DOS game based on it. And it's like a turn-based RPG, really weird and mm-hmm. like cryptic. And it, it follows the story. And the story doesn't have a great ending. Like... It's the five people being tortured throughout. There's nothing left on human earth. It's all like they're living inside the machine because the machine has pretty much covered the entire earth with circuit boards building itself out mm-hmm. over the deck, over the thousands of years it's been around. And uh, like all it does is it gets an instant where this one guy kills the four other guys to release them like from <laughs> <He's-> their torture. <laughs> like he gets to instantly kill them. And but that's he's what gotta he's gonna live. Like, but he's gotta live. And like at the end of the game, this guy, the the machine morphs the character into the human, into like this jelly, gelatinous creature that has no arms and legs. It can only slime around like a slug, so it can't kill itself. Uh, and he says, I have no mouth, because he has no he's... mouth anymore. And he mm. screams, but and that's where the I have no mouth and I must scream. That's mm. like the last line of the story. So sorry to Crazy. go off on that for like Dang, five minutes. Spoilers alert, <laughs> but, by the way, if you haven't read yeah, that old Yeah, well, book. it's like from the 60s <laughs> short story for a magazine. Uh, but it's weird that they would base a DOS game after that, after that too. <laughs> Someone must have read it. What, what and, compu- and what did, it. Robert, when you were growing up, what did you have? Consoles, computer, PC, Amiga? What did you have? Uh, I guess I started with the NES, and then um, not long after that, I got a Tandy. Uh, we had a, a Tandy at we had Tandys at school, and that when we first got computers in my first grade, they um, introduced it like we were having a new um, person come to our class, and it was going to teach us about the future. And then it was just a bunch of old Tandy computers. Now I think back, was <laughs> anything? But at the time, I was like, I saw it, and I was like, that thing's like four or five times bigger than my Nintendo. It's got to be four or five times bigger, like more powerful. So that's all I saw was like a more powerful Nintendo. And I think that's just kind of where I got hooked originally. It was just, I've been in love with computers ever since then. Yeah. Um, and then so the I've tandy, gone through all the video yeah. game consoles since then. And, um, co- so you got computers. a Tandy because the school had a Tandy. Yeah. Is I was talking it? about so it. Like, so you my could, dad, yeah. yeah, he went to Radio Shack and picked up, I think it was a Tandy 2500. Uh, like one megabyte of RAM. No, there was like uh, no hard drive in the first one we got. I don't know if it was just a bargain deal, uh, but yeah, we started <laughs> off pretty basic. And I think for years I had a, I had older like hand me down computers. And uh, at the time, I it was like kind of bummed out I didn't have a, a better computer. But looking back, I was like, this kind of like really gave me more exposure to going back further in computer history than I probably would have uh, if I just had the latest and greatest at the time. Um, but yeah, it was just that those tandies at school kind of set it off and. Hmm. Um, been hooked to it ever it's so since. funny that uh home computer thing which was so like beyond as much as i've understood beyond pc it really wasn't a big thing for you guys in america or north america like where europe and uk we had amiga commodore uh spectrum 
uh, Sinclair, all this stuff, the home computer revolution. And it was kind of a bit different for you guys. So I think that's cool that you had a Tandy in there. And you got it from your school. We had the same shitty-ass computers from some Australian manufacturer at school. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, there was no chance that uh, if anyone from Australia was just the was the micro B is the system that we grew up with. Uh, re- like one bit, two bit system. I don't know, not eight bit, not even eight bit. Uh, and they yeah. interestingly had a what would you would call it a serial bus. So everyone was connected via a ring to the network. So if one came off, then everyone was potentially upset. So there would always be shouts around the room of plug your network box in and you had to push the box in just in case it had come out because then everyone else would fall off the network. <laughs> Shitty ass old computer. Yeah, we still had that by the time I was in eighth grade. <laughs> I remember on middle school we had the ring network. Yeah, the ring network? Yeah. 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 Did uh did yeah, you Go, when you were growing Go up, was your when you were growing up uh, and you got that computer, was that something that like you had to convince your dad to do, or was he kind of into tech also? Where he thought, yeah, my it would dad's be cool a, a get. Yeah, he's an electrician and he's always been in electronics and stuff, so it was kind of up his avenue as well. And I think that half the time I was sitting there like watching what he's doing, like waiting for him to get off the computer. And thinking back now, I was like, what the hell did I do on the computer until we got the internet? But I used to play on the computer for hours and just, I would just break it and then try to repair it again. So that's actually what I did <laughs> for years before I did web development was um, computer repair and IT support. Uh, and it kind of started off with just breaking my own computer and gradually fixing friends and family and then slowly building my own little business out of it. That is just something to think about what we did on computers before mm. the internet. Because there is this whole time period where you would play some games on it, mostly mess around in basic, depending on what the machine was. Um, right, what you do? You got, especially like, Tandy, yeah, it's no hard disk. Think, it's amazing nothing. to think people were spending a lot, a lot of time on it. But you write code, that's what you just spend your time doing. <laughs> Yeah, I remember at one point we got a, a CD-ROM. Uh, I don't even think it was like a 1X CD-ROM. It was like it's such a big drive that you push the whole thing and it slide out and you stick the disc in there and it came with this oh, one yeah, disc. Yeah. And this disc, we would spend hours just going through. There was pictures. There was like, oh my gosh, there's an image of a balloon. You know, like, we just go through. <laughs> there would be like, there was many games. There was all these things. It was At the time, it seemed like the internet because it was just like this massive amount of data we were digging through. And Now looking back, I'm like, that was not very much stuff. But um, at the it's time, like, you're like it's limited like access. It's like looking through Encarta 95. Like, that exactly. was exciting. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was like, whoa, this is on a computer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's it funny how the context, thing. looking back, you're like, it was such a big deal back then. And now it's like mm. a joke. <laughs> Robert, when, you're, uh, when your father bought you the, the Tandy, was it ever a consideration that, like, on a, if you got a microcomputer, you could, like, pirate more games? Because that's exactly why my dad bought me an Amiga. Was that something your dad was conscious of? I, I don't think so, but he, he had some friends um, who were into computers. And I remember at one point we got Prince of Persia, and the guy said he'd, like, connected, he hacked into someone's computer and downloaded it, and I was just, like, blown <laughs> away. The idea that he got this data off someone else's computer on the other side of the country and put it on a floppy disk for me. <laughs> so he called yeah, into a BBS, I guess. <laughs> I, I guess so. At the time, I was like, it was before I was on the internet, so I just wasn't aware. As far as I knew, he'd like secretly uh, hacked into some system and <laughs> downloaded it. <laughs> I got on the internet about 97, and I got into computers about 91. So there was a good like five or six years where I was tinkering wow. on the computer and playing Math Blaster and <laughs> basic yeah. stuff. Yeah, that's uh yeah. I was I, I could I could still remember obviously the the kind of the phenomenon that was AOL kind of like a, another family member would be like go into a room and you hear that crazy ass noise, you know, for a second <laughs> of them connecting, and then you just remember, you know, you'd be doing something and um, downloading anything was a nightmare. Because it was just anything, anything back in those early days was so big, even a photograph could take an hour to like download or something, you know, if your system was running slow or if somebody pick, God forbid, somebody pick up the telephone on you, 
No, then it's going to drop out. Ah. Yeah. So we don't really have to. It's 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 an interesting thing to try to explain that to your kids at this point. What what yeah, you did. A, you sound like an idiot, kind of. It wasn't connected <laughs> all the time. Yeah. Yeah, just the sheer speed difference from now to then is just kind of mind-blowing. I, think, I remember downloading a, a movie for the first time, and it took like 30 hours. And it, I think it was a DivX compressed the size of a CD. Yeah. It wasn't even you know high quality. Yeah. Um, but yeah, music, and songs, then, and stuff that... would take forever as well. Yeah. yeah. Back then, we thought that chat should be when you type the the letter comes out instantaneously on the other side remember early chat like icq i think did i yep. do that as well i can't remember or not but yeah you type the letter and it comes out i miss that chat like i want to <laughs> uh, that that's my favorite because there's no going back they saw yeah. every letter that went across i miss that irc in the <laughs> early days yeah, I remember ICQ. I, I was actually nervous because I was just like learning to read and write on the, just, and I type something. I'm like, oh shit, if I spell it wrong, they see it. <laughs> yeah, ICQ just kind of faded away after I think AOL bought them. I think it might still you could still log into it. I haven't tried it in a long time. Yeah, they had different protocols, and then they there's also the open source protocols that took over under the surface. I miss. I just want. Mean, it's not the the yeah, same. I miss that instantaneous. As it used to be. Yeah. No. Um, and maybe that'll make a comeback. <laughs> Instant well, character yeah, chat. I remember bit fighting. Um, the only when I was growing up, the and this would have been two thousand one when I went to university. The um one of the biggest selling points on the dorm for me was the high speed internet, because you couldn't. <laughs> nice. Like you couldn't even get there was uh, when I was in co high school, P they finally had started having the cable company expansion where it was literally going from like 30 channels to more like double the channels. But you had to have a box and then they started introducing cable Internet before that. Everything was dial up. And uh, the whole appeal was that, you know, you could go and then that's all you'd sit around to do was pirate whatever media you could find right <laughs> just to see it download quick yeah i'll never forget the first day i got dsl <laughs> yeah <laughs> steve were you ever from, caught uh, on campus illegally <laughs> downloading something caught on campus illegally downloading something no um they didn't care about that they were they were now the the first building i lived in there was a guy from my high school who um, was arrested, uh, but he did something way worse than downloading anything. He <laughs> he tried to. So this guy uh, wasn't really a friend of mine, but he, again, graduated high school with me, went to the same college and we're in the same dorm building. And he decided to have, I think, like a pound of marijuana shipped to him <laughs> in the dorm room. <laughs> and Jeez. that's like literally shifted to a little office there and then you go hey do you have my mail and they go what room are you and they give you the mail <laughs> so and it dude, smells <laughs> that's what i don't like so this guy he did it one time and they let him do it like i guess right because they just let it go through because he didn't get any trouble over the first one nobody knew anything about it till the second time he did a second one and then it was like 50 DEA agents, you know, you know, got him on the Jeez. ground and in the, in the uh, dorm room. Uh, so, no, there was much worse stuff going on. They didn't have like there was no. The funny thing was, is back then, you know, they did so little Internet security. I think if you really wanted to do anything, everybody was doing something bad. Even like the RAs were in there using whatever Napster to steal music. Limeade. Uh, I can't even remember what those things. Lime. What is the those early software? LimeWire. You think? LimeWire. Robert, yeah. Robert, did you do anything? Ever get caught for anything naughty at university? Downloading, <laughs> no. or doing something else, or no? I actually got almost expelled once because I was in a Facebook group where someone else was cheating. <laughs> they like took the whole class uh, aside, there, super okay. serious. They like interrogated everyone. I was like, I just joined this study group when I started the class. Never looked at the group again, but supposedly during one of the tests, they were sharing answers and 
the the university took it very seriously, like too seriously, honestly. But I was kind of pissed because wow. like I was a student, I was trying to do what I was supposed to, and now I'm getting threatened of getting kicked out of the class and potentially like losing the credit. It was just. Were you Other proven guilty that, eventually? Was justice served? Yeah, eventually. <laughs> I guess the the three four people who were actually cheating got kicked out of the class, and I'm not sure what happened, but um, they they was like they were very serious about it. I was like, dang, <laughs> I didn't realize you could get this much trouble for cheating. <laughs> like they're ready to like take yeah. That was that was the early that was the also the early days of the internet where like they were there again is like sometimes you get overreaction underreaction you don't really know what's going on right like yeah it's not like oh I'm just part of a Facebook group they're like no everybody's in this this is a conspired no, group okay, together yeah. to do this and that's why they're all there so there's an overreach because it's something new and early and then somebody's like see I told you where they were using it to cheat. <laughs> Yeah, and, it was uh, around I think 2011, so it wasn't even that early. Like, I think oh. <laughs> the, a lot of the school, the professors just didn't know anything about it. Like they didn't know the difference between you know a group and a private chat or anything like that. So they saw someone was in the group. Everyone was guilty. <laughs> but yeah, I went back to school um, in 2009 uh, to study computer science. So I had a, I had a break kind of between going out in the real world and then coming back. So I was a little bit older than everybody. And, and at that time, YouTube was, was kind of taken off. So I was able to like use YouTube for my math classes where never before I could do that. So that was kind of a cool time to be there. What, what languages were you learning in your computer science course? Um, we did um, C and C++. And then um, there were some game dev classes and we did a lot of C sharp. Um, but there's, Honestly, a lot of the computer science uh, program, at least at the University of Houston where I went, was was pretty outdated. And um, I don't know, maybe that's the base, the best to learn the basics. But I feel like we were getting ready for a software engineering job um, in the early '90s. By the time I got out of there, so <laughs> yeah, <laughs> if I wasn't doing side yeah, projects, I, I probably out, like... wouldn't. I would have been screwed. <laughs> yeah, I finished in about two thousand. No, a bit. I think a bit later, and um. Yeah, man, it was just like the, no one was no one heard of a startup before. Start up and and doing something for yourself and going independent. It was just like go work for some company, work on some old system. And uh, yeah, I'm glad now there's some dynamic opportunities for computer science grads to do that. Yeah, yeah, and actually when I was there, I, I was mm. kind of bored with what I was doing, so I I ventured off to the business school, and that's how I learned about startups. Actually, was there was a startup competition huh. and. I just kind of pitched one of the ideas I was working on and um, kind of tried to grow it into a little business after that. So it, if I didn't actually go over this other side of the school, I you know I wouldn't have got into all the web development stuff I did, which ended up leading into my first job after school. So yeah, what was kind that of a nice, Yeah, I was uh, gonna say, what yeah. was it? Uh, well, I was building a, a Chrome browser ext extension that lets you control your uh, Google TV from your web browser. Uh, so it was it was called Chrome Moat, and this was like months before the Chromecast came out. Uh -huh. So when the Chromecast came out, it was kind of like the nail in the coffin for my project because the basic idea of mine was that you could take a, like a YouTube URL and then fling it to your TV. So it was just, you could be browsing your computer and then just quickly send it to your TV and watch it full screen and do something else on your computer. Uh, Cause I spent a lot of time just sitting on the couch with my laptop watching TV at the same time. And uh, it seemed like a novel idea. I was able to pitch it at the startup competition and um, everyone liked it, but uh, and I got into a startup accelerator program at the school as well. And it was midway through that, that Google came out with their Chromecast and I kind of tried to pivot from there and it just was never able to like turn that software into anything profitable. So that's where I ended up just going to doing a full-time job after that for a while. Yeah. How many millions of venture capital funding did you get? <laughs> if you, if I didn't, you know, maybe I would have kept going with that, but, um, that was kind of like the accelerator program. It seemed like they were more geared to like teaching us how to like pitch and raise money. And I was like, I just want to build an app. I just want to build something cool. People want, <laughs> you know, if I can make money on it, then that'd be cool. And at the time yeah, I actually had a model where people could pay me if they wanted to. Hmm. So it was all donation based at the time. All right. That's like, we were talking about before how you've progressed The first is donation, then it's free ticketing you build a little trust and now you're in a great situation where people will happily fund your product and you've it sounds like as well with the usb to pc you took like uh a, another step but it was like a small controlled step you didn't just order five million 
of the products and all of a sudden have 20 things for sale, you took one small step to just make that manageable. It sounds like that's your philosophy for growing this business. Yeah, totally. Yeah, just trying to um, get something out there, make sure, you know, get it to a limited number of people, make sure everything's good before I try to scale it up to a lot of other people. Um, last, I've seen a lot of, I've followed a lot of people who've created things and I just see these nightmares with people doing pre-orders or having issues where things come back because it's something was faulty. So it's always something in my mind that I want to make sure that I create something pretty solid for everybody. Well, I think too, um, oftentimes a lot of these devices come out and they can take time to almost perfect. And we all know that with four firmware updates and the original version of something can be, it's like, you know, you know, it's like what Mike Chi has been able to do where, you know, you go from something and then you update the product to where it's just this amazing thing down the road. Um, I think there's something to be said, you know, there's a path to doing that with any product to make it good. Um, and it sounds like you're going to be able to be doing that continuously, like the way you're doing it and, uh, with the batch ordering. And so, yeah, I mean, it sounds awesome to me. We wish you nothing but the best of luck at that. And he let us know how this all goes and what other crazy controllers you're going to be <laughs> modifying. I love following the Twitter. Love it. Yeah. <laughs> so definitely, if anybody who's on Twitter again should be following Robert. We'll put the links to get the links. a of course, of course. Uh, to get into what he's the world's most famous controller giveaway, according to Chat. He's a controller guy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'm on, it's uh, controllers have just kind of become my thing. So, um, mm. always looking for new ideas. So, anyone, I'm, DMs are always open. Anyone wants to reach out? Dang, slide into his OnlyFans. That's what we're talking about. <laughs> yeah. If well, I could that, do one for controllers, annoying. then maybe. <laughs> I, I really like that. I now I really like this with with a lot of things that you're doing, and the fact that I feel like even. Once you get past, to me, if you, if you continue down the way you work on your specific like controller and your attention to details and latency, and the fact that you actually know all this stuff, you know, I, mean, I feel like you could still go into making adapters for other consoles that already have a solution, possibly with right. stuff. So, I mean, I feel like you're you found a good niche, a really great niche for yourself. So, awesome stuff. Doing good, mate. Doing good. All right. We're going to wrap it up there. Robert, thank you very much, sir, for coming on the podcast. We appreciate your time today. Definitely. Steve, yeah. Thanks good for to having see you, me. As in. always. Thank you. I know we had a weird, de there's a weird delay on this podcast. We tried our best to work around it. Sorry, Robert. We've got this weird delay. We've had it's all sort good. Of talking over it's... each other conversations. <laughs> yeah. Any life. last words, Robert? I mean, do you want to th go ahead? <laughs> any <laughs> last words, motherfucker? <laughs> Jesus, yeah. Steve, what are you going to drop on this poor bastard? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, I just no, I'm appreciate just you guys' support. And um, honestly, everyone's supporting the retro gaming community. It's been really awesome talking to everybody. And um, I think that's the best part of making these adapters is connecting with a lot of people out there and making cool stuff that people want because... I've benefited from all the cool retro gaming stuff over the years. So it's nice to, to kind of just give a little piece back there. Um, so appreciate the support and anytime anyone wants to reach out, I'm always here. Nice one. All right. Thank you very much, guys. See you next time.